my beloved brothers and sisters in the faith, we are truly thankful because we have received the calling and election from our Father Yahuwah. And so, through the grace of our King Yahushua, we have the opportunity to approach by faith, moved by love in our hearts, to be able to express thanksgiving and to render true worship to our Father and to His beloved Son. This coming weekend, we are preparing ourselves to observe the Feast of Weeks or the Pentecost celebration. We will do so with thanksgiving in our hearts. And of course, we are preparing ourselves because there's something we want, there's something we long for that we should pray for so that when we meet together on the appointed day, we shall receive the blessing of our Father Almighty. What is that? What should we include in our prayers as we prepare for that day of our celebration, the observance of the Feast of Weeks? Allow me to read the book of Psalm 63, 1 down to 5. This is what it says. Longing for God, O God, you are my God, and I long for you. My whole being desires you, like a dry, worn out, and waterless land. My soul is thirsty for you. Let me see you in the sanctuary. Let me see how mighty and glorious you are. Your constant love is better than life itself. And so I will praise you. I will give you thanks as long as I live. I will raise my hands to you in prayer. My soul will feast and be satisfied. And I will sing glad songs of praise to you. What should we include in our prayer, in our supplications, both in our congregational prayer and in our personal prayers, especially on the day when we assemble together for worship? Let us ask our Father Yahuwah that we will be able to see and how, how mighty and glorious he is, that we will see and taste his goodness and his power manifested in our life. Let us ask for Father Yahuwah to pour out his Holy Spirit through his son, Yahusha, that we may be filled with the goodness of Elohim, be strengthened in our faith once again. But what must we do as part of our preparation so that when we do assemble, we shall receive that power of the glory and spirit of our Father. The Bible teaches us that we should long for God with all of our being. Brethren, let us assemble together, not because we have to, but, but because we truly want to, that we want to be in fellowship with our Father and with His Son. And as we do so, let us contemplate and let us meditate upon His constant love. You see, the more we think about and reflect upon the love that Yahuwah has given to us, the more we prepare our hearts, the more we will feast and be satisfied on His goodness, and we will sing glad songs of praise to our Father. And so, brethren, let us prepare, let us ask for the power of the Holy Spirit that we can all be edified once again. Let us stand and we shall sing a hymn together. Everlasting Father, 
Behold your people who gather before you. Humbly, we bow our heads and our hearts to acknowledge your presence. We are undeserving of you. You are great, holy, and almighty. Yahuwah, your name be praised forever. Thank you for our calling and election because you deem us as your sons and daughters adopted to the shed blood of your only begotten. Thank you, Father, for mercy and grace. We will forever thank you when we approach you on the day of our Feast of Weeks observance. We will long for you with all of our hearts. We will remember your work of salvation and restoration. And we will thank you because, Father, you have called us to be part of this wonderful work of your mighty hands. Father, from different places throughout the world, we gather for one purpose, to beseech you that on that day when we gather together, you will manifest yourself by sending forth your Holy Spirit. Your people long for you. We want to taste your goodness, especially now so many of us are beleaguered by so many problems and burdens in life. There are some who are afflicted with sicknesses. We need refreshment from you. We need your strength, O oh Father, that we may endure and finish our race. And so we will keep knocking on your door. We will be loyal and faithful to you that no matter what happens in our life, we will forever praise your name. Our King Yahushua, thank you so much. You are the purpose, you are the meaning of all the Moedim. Thank you for being there for your servants. May you be with us now in our preparation and especially when we assemble together in your precious name. May you bless our hearts and bless our faith that we may grow and increase in wisdom in our faith and in our love through you. Father, bless us today as we study your holy words. May you move the hearts of those who will listen to your commandments that we can all be together to worship and to serve you. We ask and beg everything loving Abba in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, praises be to our loving Father that we are able to gather once again to study his words and his commandments. Welcome to this episode of the BQA Bible Question and Answer. And the question we're going to be answering will be what does last, the last will be first, and the first will be last. What does that actually mean? It's one of the statements of our King Yahushua. And it's a pretty enigmatic uh, statement, something worth looking into. And so we are thankful to one of our viewers who sent in the following question. This is the question. Good day, Brother John. I have a question for regarding what Yahushua says. Yahushua ends the parable with the statement, the last will be first and the first last for many are called, but few chosen in Matthew 20, verse 16. Also a follow-up to that is, is there a chaotic structure or pattern of this statement to the Bible stories of the sibling rivalries in the scripture? May Abba Yahuwah bless you. So basically it's a two-fold question revolving around the concept of the last being first and the first being last. Many are called, but few are chosen. So let's go ahead and address the question at hand. It is based on Matthew 20, 16. So let's read the actual passage, Matthew 20, 16. So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. And so when we ask ourselves, what does that mean? That the last will be first and the first last, we have to ask ourselves, we have to qualify what last means and first means. In other words, last in what, right? And first in what? And when you fill in the blanks, you can make this mean anything you want. This is why we have to be careful and check the context. Remember, when we read the text, we need to check the context. So when we read last will be first and the first last, it is Matthew 20, verse 16. However, Matthew 20, verse 16 is actually the conclusion of a parable that was taught by our king, Yahushua, which we find in Matthew 20, 1 to 15, and it's about the parable of the laborers. So we're going to take a look at this parable of the laborers so that we can get a context 
a basis and understanding of what it means for the first to be last and the last first. However, Matthew 20, it turns out, is not the only place where our King Yahushua mentions first will be last and the last first. And so to get the bigger context, we not only look at Matthew 20, we also look at Matthew 19. Because in Matthew 19, verse 30, our King Yahushua also gives a concluding remark. And this is after someone approaches him about life everlasting. And his concluding remark is that many who are first will be last and the last first. So we have Matthew 19, 30. We have Matthew 20, verse 16, which basically say the same thing. The first will be last and the last first. And so we need to know what does that actually mean? What principles can we learn by the teaching of our King Yahushua? So let's look at Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16. The last will be first and the first last. That's what we want to know. The meaning of that principle, the last will be first and the first last. And so it has many applications so that we can understand how we can apply this biblical passage, a principle from our King Yahushua. We need to understand the context of Matthew 20 and then also understand the context of what is written before it, Matthew 19, 16 to 30, which is about the rich man and the disciples. And then also look at what our King Yahushua adds to that, because in addition to Matthew 19, Matthew 20 also connects to Matthew 21 to 22, which speak about the parable of the two sons, the parable of the landowner, and the parable of the marriage fee. So for the purposes of our study today, we're going to look at Matthew 19 and Matthew 20, and we will reserve Matthew 21 to 22 for our next uh, BQA session. So let's go ahead and take a look at Matthew 19, 16 to 30, to understand the context of the statement, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Matthew 19, 16 to 17 says the following. Now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, uh, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So here's a rich person. And when we think of a rich person, he knows that because he has wealth, he can basically have anything he wants, because that's what wealth is able to do. If you're rich, you basically have access to whatever you want here on earth. So what does he want from our King Yahusha? He wants to know how he can receive everlasting life. And so he asks our King Yahusha, perhaps he is expecting that Yahushua is going to give the answer that will basically allow him to just pay for his way to life everlasting. What does Yahushua say to him? He says, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, which commandments? 19, 18 to 19. He said to him, which ones? Yahushua said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So basically, our King Yahushua was referring to the Shema, the Ten Commandments. And so the rich man, when he was told to keep the Ten Commandments, what was his reaction? 18 to 20, he said to him, which ones? Yahushua said, you shall not murder, honor your father, and all that, the Ten Commandments. And in verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my Youth, what do I still lack? And so here we have this rich man. And in his thinking for a person to obtain everlasting life, it's something that's within his own power to do. And usually when people obtain riches for themselves through hard work, ingenuity, applying human wisdom, and so they amass wealth for themselves, they kind of get this idea, if you work hard enough for something, you can receive it. And so he's thinking the same thing about everlasting life. Oh, all I need to do is obey the commandments and I will receive everlasting life. That's good. And so he says to our King Yahushua, I've done all of that ever since I was young. And so that's not a problem for the rich young man. However, our King Yahushua delivers a message that will reveal the true heart of this rich man. What is it? Verse 21, it says, Yahushua said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow 
me. And so here we have the actual requirement for everlasting life. It's not so much what we can do on our own, but what Yahusha can do for us. This is why for one to receive everlasting life. Yes, we need to keep the commands, but that's not going to get you to everlasting life. What will get you to everlasting life? Perfection. Because without perfection, we have to be accountable for what we're not perfect about, which means we are sinners. And even one sin, let's say we're 99% perfect, if we're guilty of one sin, that one sin is going to cause us to stumble, we have to pay for that sin. We don't want that. We need perfection. The only way for us to be perfected is to be into the body of Yahushua so that he will pay for our sins. This is why he says to this rich man, follow me. And for this rich man to be able to follow him, what does Yahushua require from him? That he sell all he has and give to the poor. So this is a big test for that rich young man. Take note, this instruction of our King Yahushua is not the, the, the instruction for all, for all human beings. He's not telling all of us, go sell all of our stuff and give it to the poor and then follow him. This was a specific instruction to the rich man to sell all of his stuff and follow him because he wants to teach us something about the heart of man. And so when the rich man is given this instruction to go ahead and sell all of his possessions and follow him, what does he say? What happens to him? Let's read 22 to 24. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Then Yahushua said to his disciples, Surely I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And so when the rich man was instructed to sell his possessions, and then follow Christ, what was his reaction? He became sorrowful. He left. He did not follow Yahushua because he had great possessions. And so what does this show us about this rich man? He loved his possessions more than he loved Yahushua. He loved his possessions more than he wanted everlasting life. He thought he can do some kind of work. He thought he can buy his way to the kingdom of heaven. That's not the way to salvation. The way to salvation is by following our king, Yahushua. And so what does Yahushua say? Which is why this whole scenario took place. What was, this pur what is, what was its purpose to illustrate something about the gospel and everlasting life? He goes on to say it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, why did our King Yahushua say that? Does it mean it's impossible for rich men to be saved? Let's read the answer of our King Yahushua. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, well, who then can be saved? But Yahushua looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, our King Yahushua was emphasizing the fact we cannot do anything that will cause us to be deserving of salvation. You get it? The only way for us to be saved is by who? By the work of our father Yahuwah through his son, Yahushua. And so the rich man, thinking that because he was able to attain riches for himself, he also thinks that the works he's able to do can apply to obtaining everlasting life. Brethren, salvation and everlasting life is by grace. It's not something that we deserve. It's something that is to be given. This is why it's impossible or almost impossible for rich men. It's hard for rich men to enter into the kingdom because rich men oftentimes place their trust in the riches, in their self-efficacy instead of trusting in the work of Yahuwah. This is why our King Yahushua says it's very difficult for rich men to be saved. However, if we want to be saved, we need to trust not in our works, but the work of our Father. So what we find in these passages so far is that our material possessions, it has no bearing for salvation. I mean, during the days of our King Yahushua, when a person was rich, it was an indication 
of God's favor upon them. This is what they were thinking. However, our King Yahusha is basically destroying that understanding, that belief. Material possessions have nothing to do with our standing in heaven. So that's something that Yahusha wanted to destroy. And so when he said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last, it is a powerful and memorable way to say that Yahuwah's values are different from the world's values. Because when we understand human thinking, those who were last should be last. Those who were first should be first. Because according to human values, there's a correspondence. However, when it comes to Yahuwah's values, it's often different from the world's values. This is why we need to ask ourselves, last in what? First in what? For example, there are many people today who may be poor in the world's eyes, but they are rich in Yahuwah's eyes, right? There are people who think they have nothing, but they actually have everything. Proverbs 13, verse 7, there's one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing. And one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. And so when we understand the value system that Yahuwah has established, it's vastly different from the way we think, from the way the world operates. And so there are people who think they are poor, but they're actually rich. And there are people who think they are rich, but they're actually poor. This is why in one of the parables of our King Yahushua in Luke 12, 15, 21, he said to them, take heed and be aware of covetousness. For once life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have made, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those who will then Whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. For human beings today, people who live in the world, what is their standard of blessing? Material possessions, material success. Just like here in the parable of our King Yahusha, he spoke of a man who was so rich, he did not know what to do with his riches. And so his main problem was, how can I, how can I build a barn big enough to be able to store all of my riches. Because there's this belief that life is all about the abundance of the things you possess. This is why people are so unwilling to let go of the material stuff. And so they pay for storage to store all their goods. <laughs> Can you imagine that? But our King Yahushua says, no. There are people who are rich materially. There are people who have abundant possession. But in the eyes of our Father Yahuwah, which is what counts the most, they are poor. They are not rich toward God. So how can a person who is poor be rich toward God? James chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? And so on the day of judgment, I think many people are going to be surprised because there are many who think, you know, all the people who we are, we are going to see in heaven are those who are rich and affluent. But in actuality, those who are going to see in heaven, most of them are going to be poor. Because for Yahuwah God has chosen the poor and not the rich. It doesn't mean that there are, there, it doesn't mean that if you're rich, you're not going to receive salvation. No, that's not the point. The point is, regardless of our standing, materially speaking, we need to be rich in God. You get it? We need to be rich in faith. How so? By our good works. And so we need to understand that by the standard of the Holy Bible, there are those who will be last in material wealth, but first in spiritual wealth. The rich man, he, had, he was uh, basically first in material wealth, but last in spiritual wealth, because he rejected the greatest wealth, the greatest spiritual wealth of all. What is that? Our fellowship with our king, Yahushua. That's our greatest spiritual wealth. And he rejected that because he did not want to lose his material 
well. And so in that sense, even though he's first, materially speaking, he's going to be last. Well, how about an example of one who's last, but will be first? Matthew 19, 27. So Matthew 19, 27 is a continuation of the conversation Yahushua's just having with the rich man and also with his disciples. Because Peter, bump, uh, Peter jumps in and says, then Peter answered and said to him, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So here's Peter, who's saying to our King Yahushua, the, the rich man was not willing to sacrifice his possessions. And then the apostles, together with the others, they go to Yahushua and say, we left all and followed you. What shall we have? But what's the answer of our King Yahushua? So Yahushua said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit in 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And then he goes on to say in verse 30, but many who are first will be last and last first. So now we kind of get a context of what our King Yahushua is trying to communicate to us when he says those who are first will be last and those who are last will be first. Here we have the apostles, the disciples. They lost much. What did they lose because they wanted to follow our king, Yahushua? They lost everything. And so when Yahushua responded to them, what was his promise? He said to them, now in the present, he was speaking to them in the present, you lost all these things. But I say to you, in the regeneration, you're going to receive so much more. You shall receive a hundredfold and inherit everlasting life. And this is a promise of our King Yahushua to anyone who's willing to lose for the sake of following our, our Christ Yahushua. You see, for those who truly want to be a disciple, it will actually cost us something. It costs to follow Christ. And sometimes we have to sacrifice so much. And there are many who are in the assembly of Yahushua today who lost everything. They lost their uh, friends. They lost their social life. Sometimes they even lost um, re uh, relationships with family members because they have decided to make Yahushua their priority. Isn't that right? It happened to us. And we are thankful because even though from the eyes of many, we have lost a lot, in the eyes of Yahushua, we gained so much more. A hundredfold and eternal life is what we shall receive. This is why even though we are last, according to some, we can be first because of our King Yahushua. So again, we have to keep asking last in what, first in what. In this context, last in our present possessions, but first in future possessions. But what matters most? What will be the number one determinant in how we can be last and end up becoming first? Well, if we compare the two responses from the rich man and the disciples, what do we find that should open our eyes? Well, the rich man went away sorrowful. He chose not to follow Yahushua. The disciples Instead of going away sorrowful, they decided to follow Yahushua. See, the, the number one determining factor is that we follow Yahushua. We have to be willing to follow Yahushua at all costs. The rich man, he, wanted, he was willing to follow Yahushua, but only to a certain point. He was not willing to give up his possessions. But for the apostle Peter and the others, they were willing to leave everything behind this is why if we want to be a true disciple of our King Yahushua, we must be willing to be last. In other words, we must be willing to give up everything, even if it means losing our life. This is why the principle of first, uh, last is first and first is last is basically the same thing 
with what Yahushua said in Matthew 16. When he said, and Yahushua said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come with me, he must forget self, carry his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his own life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so according to our King Yahushua, we need to understand that when it comes to him, everything that we are willing to lose for his sake, we're going to gain so much more because of him. And anything that we're going to keep for our sake, for our selfish sakes, to the point that we ignore him, we're going to lose that. And Apostle Paul even acknowledged this in Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so we have principle number one of the last verse, first last uh, saying, which basically says this, those who sacrifice for the sake of Yahushua will gain. Those who gain by forsaking Yahushua will lose. And so it's all about the willingness of one to make sacrifices for the sake of our king, Yahushua. You see, when we sacrifice for the, for the sake of our king, Yahushua, everything we lose, that's going to end up into becoming a great gain. This is why no matter what we face in our life, even if it means we have to lose our network of friends, even if we have to lose our social life, even if we have to lose our own family, for the sake of following Yahushua, we need to do so. Because even if we die by following our King Yahushua, we will gain. And it's one principle of the last, first, first, last statement of our King Yahushua. However, there's also another principle behind it. And this is reflected in the parable of our King Yahushua which we find in Matthew 20, 1 to 16. Let's go ahead and read Matthew 20. This is what it says. It's a parable. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. Nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard at noon, and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again. He saw some people uh, standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. So here we have a nice parable. How many here have heard about this parable before? Perhaps you have. And it's a very, very interesting and very provocative um, parable of our King Yahushua. And it speaks so much about the gospel. You see, here's uh, what the kingdom of heaven is like. There's a landowner. And so he has a vineyard. And so he's looking for workers. And so he goes out and he spots people just standing around doing nothing. Take note, these people who were brought in to work for him were people who don't deserve work. It's not like you have a good background. I want to hire you. It's not like they were demanding you hire me because I'm qualified. These people basically are not qualified. This is why they're not doing anything. They're just hanging around, basically like homeless people outside his vineyard. And so this landowner goes outside, sees all these homeless people who don't have work and doing nothing, and approaches them, and then he finds one that he hires at nine o'clock in the morning, and then one at noon, then one at three o'clock. And then he finds one at five o'clock, right? And hires him too. And so they all work in the vineyard. There's the first one uh, started working at nine o'clock. The last one started working at five o'clock. And so what happened once the, 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 the time for working is finished? Well, at, during the evening time of uh, verse 8, that evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. So now the, the, work, the work was finished. It's time to pay the wages. And so what the landowner said, we're going to pay first the last worker. What time did you work? Five o'clock. And so what did they pay? this person who worked at five o'clock, let's read nine to 10. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, 
they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. And so when the people hired at five were given the wages, it was a full day's wage, right? And so that tells you this landowner is really gracious. But then when the others who were hired before the people who were hired at five o'clock, which means they were working for longer times, right? They were expecting to be paid much more. They assumed to receive much more. How much were they given? They were given the same wage, a full day's wage. So basically everyone got paid the same, even though not everyone put in the same amount of work. And so what did the people who were hired before five o'clock, what did they do? Let's read 11 and 12. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. And so how many of you would take the side of these people who were not receiving pay, who did not receive more pay compared to the people who were hired at five o'clock? You probably will say to yourself, that's kind of unfair, right? I mean, I worked harder than the person there who worked at five o'clock. I mean, I was working under the 12 o'clock noon sun, right? And so I deserve to be paid more. And so they protested, right? And after they protested, what was the response of the landowner? Let's read uh, 13. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give you, I, I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? You see, though the, the people who wanted to protest or those who protested, they did not see something that they should have saw. What is that? the goodness of the landowner, because none of the workers deserved to be hired. None of the workers were deserving to be put to work in the vineyard. They got brought in. And so instead of looking at the goodness of the landowner, what did they focus on? They focused on what they believe was unfair treatment. But well, what does the landowner say? He says, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not being unfair because it's up to me how I want to give out my blessing. And so if, you want, if I want to bless this person who got in at five o'clock, what is that to you? You just need to focus on the good that you receive from me. And so after saying that, our King Yahusha concludes, so the last will be first and the first last for many are called, but few chosen. Now, what then does that mean in this context? That the last will be first and the first last. When we read this parable of our King Yahusha, what is it about? What's the message of this parable all about? Well, we see that there are people complaining after they got the opportunity to work at the vineyard and receive a payment, right? And so when people complain about what others have been given. Basically, we are demanding God to give us what we deserve. And so the people in the parable were basically telling the landowner, give me what I deserve. But do you think that's a wise thing to demand from God? What do you think? Do we actually want God to give us what we deserve? <laughs> I want you to think about that. Because when you look at that parable, the landowners, I mean, the, uh, the people who were hired are basically demanding the landowner, give me what I deserve. And so the parable is about Yahuwah giving us salvation, right? It points to that. And so we need to ask ourselves, do we want God to give us what we deserve? If we ask God to give us what we, what we deserve, what would happen to us today? We would be gone, right? You see, what we want is not what we deserve. What we want is mercy and grace. You see, what the parable reveals is that the gospel is all about 
the way of mercy and the way of grace. When people read that parable, they do not see how Yahuwah works out his plan of salvation. It is through mercy and grace. Because otherwise, if we were to be given what we deserve, none of us are going to be saved. And so we need mercy and grace. What is mercy? Well, basically, mercy is not receiving the punishment that we deserve, right? What is grace? Receiving the blessing we do not deserve. And so if we're going to ask Yahuwah, why did you pay this man this much and not pay me this much? We are telling him, give us what we deserve. If we all get what we deserve, what would that mean? None of us are going to be saved. And so what the parable points to is, do not rely on your own goodness. Do not rely on your own good works. Instead, humble yourself before Yahuwah. This is why Matthew 23, 11 and 12, the greatest one among you must be your servant. Whoever makes himself great will be humble. And whoever, whoever humbles himself will be made great. You know, Matthew 23 is all about our King Yahusha's reprimand against the Pharisees who were religious leaders and they were relying on their own goodness they were making themselves great. And so they're expecting salvation. What our King Yahushua says, those who want to be great should become servants. Those who make, who make themselves great will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be made great. Doesn't that sound so much like the last shall be first and the first shall be last? Right? This is why that's the second principle of the last first, first, last statement of our King Yahushua. Those who humble themselves will be made great. And those who make themselves great will be humbled. And so when we think about our own salvation, we should not approach God thinking that we deserve it. And to illustrate this idea of the last first and first last when it comes to salvation, we have the following story, a true story in the book of Luke 23, 39 to 43. And one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do not even fear God. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Yahushua, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Yahushua said to him, assure me, I say to you, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Here is a person who does both of them, the both, two criminals, who, together with Yahushua on the, on the cross. The two people who were with Yahushua on the cross, do they deserve salvation? Do they deserve eternal life? No. Of the three who were on the cross that deserve eternal life, who was the only one? Only Yahushua, his only perfect one. The other two were? Criminals, perhaps their whole life, they devote in doing what is wicked, the eyes of Yahuwah. They did not deserve salvation. But then take a look at the statement of one of those who were, who were, who were on the cross. He said, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing. Wrong. You know, there's that one of the two criminals recognized his own what? Sin. He humbled himself because he knows he doesn't deserve salvation. What he deserves is punishment. But then because he approaches Yahushua with a humble heart, Yahushua says today, surely I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. Is this man going to be saved because of his works? No. He's not going to be saved because of his works. He's not going to be saved because he deserves it. He's going to be saved because we find two things in Yahushua. What are they? Mercy. What's the other one? Grace. I want you to remember that. Mercy and grace. What was mercy again? when we do not receive what we deserve. What did this man on the cross deserve? 
to die, perhaps even in the lake of fire. That's what he deserves. What did he did not? What did he not deserve? Everlasting life. He did not deserve that. But that was promised to him. Why? By grace. You see, when we approach Yahushua by denying self, we are bringing mercy and grace upon ourselves. And there's a reason why Yahuwah wants us to rely upon Yahushua and not our own works. What is that? Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so, brethren, we should never think that we can ever work our way to salvation. Our salvation is based by the grace and mercy of our king, Yahushua. This is why when we think of last is first and first is last, there are people who are going to make themselves great, but they're going to be disappointed. Judgment day. And there are going to be people who really, really look at their sin and repent. They're going to be great on the day of salvation. Now, who's an example of one who deserved the worst? Because he was the worst of sinners, but was given grace and mercy. I think you know about this person, right? Not just a criminal who was on the cross with our King Yahushua. There was also another person who received mercy and grace when he needed it the most. What's the name? Who do you think it is? And so he was called last, but he is first among works. <laughs> who, do you think, who do you think that could be? Let's read the book of Timothy 4. Uh, Timothy 1, 14 and 16. And our Lord poured out his abundant grace, right? On me and gave me the faith and love which are ours in union with Christ Yahushua. This is a true saying, to be completely accepted and believed. Christ Yahushua came into the world to save sinners. I am the worst of them. But God was merciful to me in order that Christ Yahushua might show his full patience in dealing with me, the worst of sinners, as an example for all those who would later believe in him and receive eternal life. Also, Paul says he was the worst of sinners. You know why he said that? Because he persecuted and he did things that led to the death of certain followers of Yahushua. In fact, he was on his way to Damascus to put into prison those who were worshiping Yahushua Christ. But what happened to him on the way there? He was called by our King Yahushua. Not because he deserved it, but because of grace and mercy. And so the number one persecutor of the ecclesia became the number one evangelist, the number one apostle who would represent our King Yahushua. The last shall be first, the first shall be last. And so when we think of our own life, beloved brothers and sisters, when we look at ourselves, maybe sometimes we are afraid to approach Father Yahuwah, because we know that we are not worthy of him. We know we are not worthy of his beloved son. And so we don't even bother because we say in the back of our minds, I don't deserve Yahuwah. I don't deserve Yahushua. How can I keep on worshiping him? How can I keep on going to them? But what is the message of the Holy Scriptures to those who, because they acknowledge their sin, they have this feeling of guilt and shame that keeps them away from approaching the Father and the working Yahushua. This is the invitation that the Bible gives us in the book of Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Yahushua, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we, that we are, but did not see it. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne, for there is grace. There we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. Brothers and sisters, 
do you sometimes feel shame and guilt to the point that you're afraid to approach Yahuwah, that you were afraid to approach Yahusha? The Bible says that is precisely the time when we need to understand the principle of what it means for the last to be first and the first to be last. When we acknowledge our sin, when we are moved to repentance and we feel the guilt of our sin, the shame of our sin, to the point that we say to ourselves, woe is me. That is the perfect time to approach the throne of grace. Why? Because our King Yahushua is our great high priest. And what is it about our great high priest? that allows us to be able to approach the Father, even if we are sinful in our ways. Yahushua says that he can sympathize with our weaknesses because he also endured many temptation and was able to overcome sin. But he knows we are weak, not strong like him. And so he offers himself to be the throne of grace. But when we approach him, if you notice what the Bible says, right when you need it the most, you will find mercy. You will find grace. Sometimes when we are overwhelmed by sorrow, when we don't know where to turn, what to do, turn to the throne of grace. Our working Yahushua, when we feel like we are the worst of sinners, he can make us pure and clean as white as snow because he was the one who shed his blood for us. But when we approach our father, Yahuwah, what must be our attitude so that even if we make ourselves low, we will be exalted. We will be forgiven and made great in the eyes of the father. Let's read again this parable of our King Yahusha. Luke 18, 9 to 12, Yahusha also told this parable to people who were, who were sure of their own goodness and despised everybody else. Once there were two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood apart by himself and prayed, I thank you, God, that I am not greedy, dishonest, or an adulterer like everybody else. I thank you that I am not like the tax collector over there. I fast two days a week. And I give you a tenth of all my income. Here we have a religious leader, a Pharisee. And when he prayed to the father, he was so full of himself. He was so sure of his own righteousness. He was so sure of his own goodness. But when he compared himself to other people, he was so proud. He would even despise those who were not like him. And so he was mentioning in his prayer all the things that make him worthy of salvation. He says, I'm not greedy, I'm not dishonest, I'm not an adulterer like everyone else, like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all my income. And so when it comes to this Pharisee, he was so sure because he was placing his hope and trust in his own works. And he made himself great. He made himself great before the eyes of the father. But then when the tax collector prayed his prayer, what did our King Yahusha observe and said? Let's read 18, 13 or 14. But the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even raise his face to heaven, but beat on his breast and said, God have pity on me, a sinner. I tell you, said Yahusha, the tax collector and not the Pharisee was in the right with God when he went home. For all who make themselves great will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be made great. And this is the perfect illustration, brothers and sisters, of the principle of the last being first and first being last. The Pharisee made himself great. He thought when it comes to salvation, he would be the first in line to be receiving his share. And when it comes to being last, this tax collector, he could not even look. He could not even raise his face to heaven. Beat on his breast and said, God, have pity on me, a sinner. But then Yahushua said, 
what do you think was put right before God? And he says, it's not the Pharisee, but the tax collector who humbled himself. And Yahushua says, those who humble themselves will be made great. And those who make themselves great will be humble. Brethren, the whole point of the gospel is this. Even the worst of sinners can receive salvation. And even the most confident of self-righteous individuals will be abased and be humble. And so brethren, no matter what we have done in our life, it's never too late. It's never too late to return to Yahuwah through Yahusha. But it does require an attitude, a repentant heart. When we say to ourselves, I am a sinner. I confess my guilt. And we beat our chest. And we feel the sorrow of our sin. And when we do that, when we humble ourselves, Yahuwah is going to raise us and elevate us and make us great because he will forgive our sins and he will make us a son and daughter who will receive and inherit life everlasting. That is our lesson for today. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Everlasting Father, merciful Abba Yahuwah, we are here before your presence because of your mercy and grace. We don't deserve your kindness, but daily and always, we find it in our hearts. We find it in our circumstances. This is why, regardless of what is happening throughout the world, the threats of violence and poverty and hardship, we find confidence in you because you provide for the needs of your people. That is your grace, O oh Father. Thank you for your mercy, for we deserve your punishment. We deserve your wrath. But because of the shed blood of your son, we have received grace instead. And so because of your son, though we deserve punishment, though we are last in everything, we can become first. We can become your sons and your daughters. Our King Yahushua, thank you so much because you are our intercessor, our high priest, our Mashiach. We have faith in you. And so we place our hearts upon you, affix our hope upon you, for you are our deliverer. You are the promised one. We praise and worship you forevermore. Father, thank you so much for being with us today. In the study of your holy words, may you continue to strengthen our faith and empower us always. We believe, Father, you have listened to our prayers. We ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, so thank you so much for joining us in our Bible study. Uh, please do take note that our study concerning the first and the last, and the last and the first is not yet concluded. We will have part two, because when we go back to Matthew 20, 13 and 16, there's a last part there that says, for many are called, but few are chosen. So what does that mean? And we will connect this to one of the questions that was also raised, which is, is there a chaotic structure or pattern of this statement of the Bible stories of the sibling rivalries in scripture? And you're going to find very, very compelling evidence for another application of the last is first and the first is last in scripture that follow the pattern of scripture. And then we'll connect everything to Matthew 21 through 22, the parables of our King Yahushua concerning the two sons, the landowner, and the marriage feast. So that will be next week for our BQA Bible question and answer, which is part two of this episode. Uh, also, this coming weekend, let's not forget, is our uh, Pentecost worship service, the Feast of Weeks. It will be Saturday, uh, May 27, 2023, at 4 o'clock p.m. California time, or PST, Pacific Standard Time, which means in the Philippines, it's going to be on a Sunday. So please uh, check the, uh, the time conversion in your area. And so we're going to have only one service for this weekend. And that will be Saturday, May 27, 2023. By the way, this is also going to be an in-person gathering. So if you are in the area in Northern California and you want to join us in person, we would, of course, love to have you. We'll be happy to have you join us so that we can have some fellowship time together as well. In preparation for our special 
worship service, we have our preparatory prayer, which we already began um, on Monday. We continued today. We will continue all the way until Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. On Thursday, we're going to have also um, a, a BHP lesson concerning the Pentecost, concerning the Feast of Weeks. And we're going to talk about two mysteries, two very, very intriguing mysteries about the Feast of Weeks. And we're going to talk all about that in our BHP in preparation for our special worship service on the weekend. Let us all, may Yahuwah Abba and Yahusha Hamashiach bless all of us.